Hi everybody, it's Nathan Cool with Swell Watch on SurfingMagazine.com. It's time for another El Nino update. It's now August 18th, and a lot has happened in the last week. If you've been watching the news, you've seen a media melee of uh, all kinds of reports coming out. Somebody from JPL actually said that this was going to be a Godzilla El Nino. And of course, if you look at all the different uh, TV and newspaper headlines and everything, it all looks the same. Everybody basically picked up on the same report, few little quotes and some sound bites, and they've been blasting it all over the media. Sorry for all the, the media contacts that I have, but I know you're doing your job as best as that you can. But I want to be able to describe some stuff that may not be so newsworthy uh, for, for a lot of the public, but you might enjoy uh, seeing why this El Nino is very different. If you've been following me the last couple El Nino videos that I've done, and especially on SwellWatchSurfingMagazine.com, you know that we're up against a very different environment uh, across the Pacific this year, so it's causing a, a different type of El Nino. So everybody's wondering, what are we going to expect? Is it going to be a big surf? Are we going to get a lot of rains? And everybody compares this to 97, 98. And one of the things I want to show you a little bit more detail of why this is different this time around than 97 to 98 and also really what did happen we think back on the 97 98 but was it really more anecdotal than what we have actually data to support it so i'm going to run through those details now and then sum up on what we can expect for the coming winter check it out First, what I'd like to do is talk about the rain. It's one of the, the biggest signals, of one of the biggest results that we get out of El Nino. So here I've plotted out these. This is uh, rain totals uh, measured at the USC campus uh, through uh, different years. And so we can take a look at uh, when we started getting into our recent drought around 2012, you can see the rainfall totals really dropped out. Had a, somewhat of a drought, you can remember, uh, back in the uh, mid 80s, after we had that very strong El Nino back in 82 and 83, which created quite a bit of rainfall. In fact, that rainfall was much greater than uh, what we saw in 97, 98. And if you remember in the 97, 98 El Nino, one of the things I've mentioned in my prior videos is this was a very peaky El Nino. So when we take a look at El Ninos from years past, we can see that 97, 98 here, very strong peak. It happened very quickly, it was rather abrupt. Um, and then we had long periods of La Nina. You can see different type of El Nino patterns here. That's what's in the red on the top, La Nina's below. Uh, that we've had quite a few El Ninos. Here's a very strong one, 82, 83. And then we've had some that have been long lasting. Recently, we have been into a growing El Nino, but it wasn't as peaky, for one thing, as what we've seen. So let's take a look at that peak. What did that really mean when it came to that amount of rainfall that we were seeing during that 97-98 uh, winter? So this is the uh, rain totals by month uh, we take a look at for 97-98. You can see a lot of stuff looks pretty typical for what you'd expect for a winter. You see November, a couple inches of rain, maybe a little bit early uh, for Southern California, uh, December and January. Then look at what happened in February, and this is what everybody remembers, almost 14 inches of rain in, uh, measured in L.A. And uh, so there was a lot of rain that was pounding the coast back then, but if it wasn't for this one spike in February, we'd think that this would be pretty much a normal winter. So taking a look at something else here. These are the warning days per month. So going back in a climatic database and taking a look at the warnings that the National Weather Service issued at different months. And the blue ones, that's high surf. Red, those are flood or rain. And also this included uh, for the high surf any rip current uh, warnings. Now back then also, they didn't issue quite as often as I recall. And that on my part is actually anecdotal. But let's go ahead and just take a look at this. Uh, when we take a look at January uh, 1998, really getting into the full winter, there was three distinct high surf warnings. Now, those high surf warnings did last for a few days, no doubt about it. And this is also when we went into the, uh, the, the, the big Wednesday, big Friday. I'll get to that in just a second, show you some examples. Uh, when we got into February, it pretty much died off by March. Uh, this thing was pretty much done. It had pretty much uh, ran its course. So if you remember though, at the end of January, we saw this. So this was Big Friday in California. Big Wednesday was a couple days earlier, and that occurred uh, in Hawaii. A very large swell. One of the things very typical that happens during an El Nino, the reason why we get so much rain and the bigger surf, the uh, jet stream drops, and we have a more westerly angle of incoming storms. And shown here, that 280 degrees, 280 degrees here shown on the spectrum. That's where the swell was coming from. 
it was at a very low latitude and of course that's why we got a lot of rain from those storms and of course we can then get the bigger surf from that. But let's take a look though. We remember Big Friday but what was that actually like? What was that month like? So let's take a look at the sea dip models that actually run through the months of January and February back in 1998. I was able to pull up quite a few of these and we can see that starting out 6 January, yeah, we had some northwest swell, very steeply angled. And you can see by these colors, that really isn't that out of the ordinary as January was underway. So let's start moving that forward in time. Yeah, very unimpressive, whatever. There's some stuff coming in here now on the 10th of January. This is a fairly good sized swell, fairly good sized northwest swell uh, starting to fill in. Uh, a lot of areas were starting to really pick that up. Uh, typical though with a 290 degree northwest swell, it wasn't one of the really El Nino driven ones at that very low latitude. Typical northwest ground swell, although it was strong with 17 periods. 17 second periods, I should say. So let's move that forward, and yeah, it uh, quickly died off. Not a whole lot happened. Then we start getting something around the middle of January, and this is one of the first major swells that happened during the winter time. Still at a northwest angle, though. So El Nino driven, definitely, but wasn't at a very low latitude. In fact, it didn't take long till that storm moved quickly up into the Gulf of Alaska, and that's why we have this 300 degree swell angle here. We're not seeing nearly as much of it. Swell died off. And then after a while, we start seeing something else pick up. A little bit more, now we start seeing that 280 to 5 degree angle. We're starting to get down into the El Nino driven, low latitude, uh, jet stream type driven storms. And we start seeing even more of that, 285 degrees, a lot more swell coming in. Now that we're getting toward the end of January, this is 20th, January 1998. So let's move that even forward more in time. And of course, swell dies off, but there is always something behind it. Here we are, almost a perfect direct west swell. 26 January 1998, very strong. This is one that was in the record books and then a couple days later we had Big Friday. Very typical swell and of course this one knocked the end of the Ventura Pier off, caused a lot of property damage um, along the California coast as well. A lot of homes were damaged uh, right there. So uh, this was one of the reasons being though is that we had this westerly swell, a very large surf. You see it's about 16 foot seas uh, out there. So it was strong surf that was pounding the coast, but it wasn't happening all month long. So this was a very short period during when we had the uh, rains were uh, starting to pick up right before February got underway. So the El Nino storms were really kind of in this area at the end of January, end of February. And once again, it was a very peaky El Nino. Things didn't happen, you know, over a long span. So it was, you know, not to diminish the, the, the strength of what El Nino was that year, but it was a very quick moving type of system. So let's move along here uh, and take a look at where we are now. You might remember this from my last uh, video report. And now that we have a three month mean uh, showing where the temperatures are, 1997, uh, that was in blue. And here we are at the uh, May, June, July, three month mean. And uh, the two, uh, excuse me, the 2015 is the purple one up here. We are at the exact same El Nino signal that we were during the 1997 event. But something very important to note, mentioned this in my last video, it was a very peaky event in 1997, very quick rise in those sea surface temperatures where look at what's happening here, it's kind of leveling off with what we have for 2015. That's one of the interesting things that's happening with the signal. But we've also got the PDO backing it up and the PDO back in 1997 once again was very peaky. This is a El Nino's big brother uh, kind of a thing, can last for decades at a time. You can see the signal though in 97 came up and then it quickly went down where here in 2015 on this purple line, we are more on a steady rise and more importantly, we're still stronger than the other El Nino years when it comes to that PDO signal. But there's a problem. And this could be a, a significant problem when we try to make a correlation to 1997, 1998's El Nino. So the time graph here, this is time going forward on the y-axis, starting out of September 2014 and on the bottom August 2015 and across the x-axis, those are degrees of longitude. 80 degrees west over here is uh, the, our, our El Nino zone. It's uh, right off the uh, coast of uh, Ecuador, Peru. And then what we know as the El Nino 3.4 region, which is where a lot of these other numbers come from, it's in around here. And you notice it's like, yeah, in this area, we're starting to see off the charts temperatures, 2.5 degrees. But look at what's happening over here on this side of the Pacific. Things are cooling down. Now, 
to mention before, we do go in waves. So it's like very hot, a little bit colder, very hot, a little bit colder. And things are somewhat cyclic like that. So there were some strong westerly winds, sure enough, as per uh, shown on earlier models last month, that did uh, cause another Kelvin wave. We've gotten more downwell and we've got you know some temperatures that rose. But this is the concerning part. What's happening when we take a look at that? Let's take a closer look. This is a very uh, uh, familiar uh, diagram for most. El Nino, we've got that strong uh, red uh, hot current coming off of uh, Ecuador, Peru. And by the way, this is sea level residuals, which is reflective of the uh, sea surface temperatures increasing the, uh, the height of the, the seawater. Anyways, taking a look at where we are now. This was July and this is August 5th. And look at that, there's a gap here. The waters were cooling down right off the coast of Ecuador and Peru. So that's very strange. And it's indicative of something that could be known as Madoki. And this is El Nino Madoki, and what that is, is instead of El Nino, where you've got the strong winds blowing across the equator, piling up the warm water, you kind of get winds blowing from both directions, and you get piled up water in the center. Very important to note here, not all scientists are on board with giving this type of El Nino a name. A lot of scientists feel that this is actually just a continuum, that this is just warm water. It moves across the equator and just lands in certain places. But the important thing is that no two El Ninos are alike. So looking at 1997, back in August, yeah, very strong uh, El Nino type of tail coming off of Ecuador and Peru. We can see that. Um, we don't see a whole lot of abnormal temperatures, though, that are up in the uh, Northeast Pacific. Whereas now, when we take a look, this was back last month and talked about this. There's the blob up there. We've got these abnormal warm waters that are off of California and also toward Hawaii. And we've got the El Nino tail that's growing, but now look what's happening. So if we take one more step in time, just a few more weeks, what do we have? Well, this is a little bit of a gap that's starting to form here. We've got some cooler waters off of here, but it's still abnormally warm. This is not by any means a, a, a Madoki type of El Nino. In fact, if you take a look at what that really is, this is a Madoki El Nino. This is from 2004, 2005, and this was the abnormally warm waters that were being, you know, we had winds blowing this direction, we had winds blowing this direction, so we had east and west piling up the water there. That's very different from what we're seeing now, but there is still a gap, and the, the point being here is that no two El Ninos are alike. Take a look at what's happened so far this year in the uh, the tropics, for instance. I could tell you El Nino year, the chances are statistically we're going to get more hurricanes. Well, this is the western Pacific. This is the typhoon region, and we know that there's been massive super typhoons. Let's take a look at the eastern Pacific over in our neck of the woods when we get swells and kind of yawning quite a bit. So this started off real gangbusters back in early June, but then the, most of the hurricanes have just been kind of drifting off toward Hawaii. Hilda, remember, was, was off that way. So things aren't exactly the same from when they were in 1997, when 97 had a much more active uh, hurricane season. Now, hurricane season is still getting underway. This is only August 19th, so we've still got quite a ways to go. So let's take a look now at uh, what we can expect as the future goes on. This is one of the latest uh, diagrams of the model projections uh, released by NOAA. And uh, we can see that there's a lot of variation still in the models, but there's now a good clustering. And that clustering says that we will have a strong El Nino, which is anything above 1.5 degree anomalous Celsius in the El Nino 3.4 region and could go as high as two. There are some outliers that are saying that it could get up as uh, three degrees uh, Celsius above normal, which would be a very, very strong El Nino. But it's too early to make that call. It's almost inevitable that this will happen and that we'll have a very strong El Nino either way. So how does that translate into surf and weather for this winter for Southern California? definitely, uh, it's almost inevitable that the jet stream is going to lower. We have enough of an El Nino signal going on to, to cause that to happen. So we can expect some west swells. It's a matter of, is this really going to be a peaky event? When is this really going to take off? If we were to base it off of what's happened in the tropics so far, either this is going to be the calm before the storm or we're going to get, you know, we're just going to see the, the repeat of this where it's going to be kind of Dollsville uh, throughout the winter. I don't think that's going to happen. I think there's a very, very strong chance that we're going to see very powerful swells. Once again, though, with a strong uh, westerly angle. 
And that also means that we get a lot of rainfall out of this. Uh, it would be nice if this was a long-lasting El Nino and help us get out of the drought, but more likely than not, we're going to see it, that lower jet stream. We've got a lot of low pressure that's uh, because of the warm water temperatures up in the Gulf that would influence the jet stream to stay at that lower latitude and help drive those storms uh, towards Southern California more than the Pacific Northwest. So count on heavy surf. I definitely would in the months of January, February. That's almost inevitable at this point, unless things change, and I'll have another update next month and talking about that. But if you have property, now is the time to take a look at protecting it. So uh, definitely if you're in a flood zone, take a look at uh, now investing in sandbags. Uh, make sure your roof is not leaking. Last thing you want is to have a powerful Pacific storm come in at the, you know, you haven't seen rain for who knows how long. You don't know if that roof is leaking. Take cautions for that. Get windshield wipers on your car and make sure that you got good tread on your tires. If not, invest in new all weathers. So that's all I've got for right now. Uh, I'll be issuing more of these reports as we get closer into winter. So if you want to keep up to date on these, as soon as I post one of these new videos on El Nino and other topics related to surf and weather in Southern California, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's free, doesn't cost you anything, and you'll be notified once again as soon as one of these videos is posted. You can also follow me over on surfingmagazine.com. That's at forecasts.surfingmagazine.com. And I do California, in particular Southern California. If you want, you can also follow me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Nathan Todd Cool. That's all I've got though for now. So until next time, take care, be safe, and smile in the lineup.